Michael Smith, Michael Smith. Nice. Keena Roll, Keena Roll. Nice. Keisha Stubbs, Keisha Stubbs. Nice. Stephen Lowe, Stephen Lowe. Oh, ho, ho, naughty. Get on the nice list this Christmas. Rejoice with Rare Voice when you sign up and enter to win 12 days of giveaways, including a 2015 Jeep Wrangler. A plane crash in the Clifton Pier area leaves one man dead and several others injured. The nation's murder count continues to climb with a man shot and killed in the Soldier Road area. A woman leads police on a high-speed chase and is shot by officers. And Bahamas Faith Ministries Senior Vice President Dr. Richard Pinder laid to rest. We've got those stories and more coming up tonight. I'm Dana Smith and MB12 starts right now. News tonight, a 77-year-old man is dead and several others injured after a 10-seater Navajo aircraft operated by Ferguson Air crash-landed in waters off Clifton Pier this morning. Authorities say 11 people, including a baby girl, were on board the aircraft, which experienced engine trouble during a flight from Governor's Harbor, Eleuthera, to Nassau. Eyewitnesses held the captain as a hero, noting more lives could have been lost if he hadn't been able to get the aircraft into shallow water. Monique Toot has the details. One person has been confirmed dead following a plane crash in the Clifton Pier area. NB12 is here on Stewart's Cove where EMS personnel and police officers were seen loading passengers into several ambulances. Now we understand that most of them suffered minor injuries. Led by police escorts, EMS officials raced to Princess Margaret Hospital with the 10 injured and visibly shaken survivors in tow. The survivors are all stable as far as we can assess at this point. Um, and uh, of course, they're still going to go to hospital to be assessed. Yes, yeah, some of them are able to speak with us. The injuries are really non life threatening, but we have one or two that have some fractures. The rest are just abrasion and everything. In one ambulance, a baby girl sucked on a green pacifier in her father's lap. Nearby, this older couple clung to each other and hobbled barefoot into a waiting ambulance. Another passenger, who appeared to be suffering from neck injuries, struggled to speak as her stretcher was loaded into the back of another ambulance. EMS personnel then checked the pulse of this male passenger, also wearing a neck brace. Let's load up. About an hour after those 10 people were transported to hospital, officials placed the body of the deceased, a 77-year-old Caucasian man, into the back of a white van. Authorities say a 10-seater Piper Navajo aircraft operated by Ferguson Air and chartered by Southern Air was traveling from Governor's Harbor, Eleuthera to New Providence, but experienced engine trouble as it made its descent. The pilot made a crash landing in shallow waters near Stuart Cove around 8.20 a.m. Everybody was able to get out of the aircraft. A total of 10 adults and one infant. One person was found in the water, an elderly gentleman, we believe to be uh, possibly an American citizen, uh, succumbed to injuries. Minutes after the plane went down in waters near Stuart Coves, employees quickly sprung into action, jumping into this very vessel, speeding out into that area and trying to rescue those on board. They recall seeing heads bobbing in the water. They say their rescue mission took about three or four minutes. It's really frightening right now. Um, it's really tense, um, but we saw a lot of debris. We picked up the people, luckily um, got them on safely, um, were very shaken and um, try to come in as much as possible. Stuart Cove's boat captain, Perry Roberts, says the occupants of another boat attempted to rescue the passengers, but that vessel started to sink. He says that's when he saw the body of the 77-year-old man. He was just slumped over into the on-sinking boat that we met. Um, 
in progress with the rescue. We had to take them off, but um, he was just limped over. He was a little guy bleeding from the mouth. Stuart Cove's owner, Stuart Cove, hailed the pilot, identified as Captain Rufus Ferguson, as a hero, noting this tragic incident could have been much worse. So he picked the only calm piece of water on this island in this terrible wind, and he landed that plane, uh, as, my, as I understood, perfectly on the water. And instead of one victim, if he had landed in the rough water or tried to land on the land, it could have been uh, 10 victims. It could have been a whole lot worse he's than it hero. was. He's like the, the Captain Scully from the Miracle on the Hudson. I think this is our own Bahamian Captain Scully. Rescue teams were able to recover a toolbox and several plane seats before the aircraft sank 6,500 feet deep in the water. Accident investigator Delvin Major says getting to that aircraft could pose a challenge. Uh, well, it makes it quite difficult because um, it's a great depth that we have to, to look at. But it, it all depends. We'll speak with the pilot and if he is able to give us good information as to what happened, there may not be a need for us to try and get the aircraft. This incident comes less than a month after nine people, including Dr. Miles Monroe and his wife, were killed in a plane crash in Grand Bahama. We have been, I wouldn't say clamping down, but we have been doing oversight of all of the aircraft and the airlines that operate here. And it's just unfortunate that it's one of the things that just happened. Authorities visited the hospital to get a first-hand account of the tragic incident from the pilot and survivors. Investigations continue. Reporting for NB12, I'm Vonique Tude. The country's murder count hit 111 last night after a man was murdered during a double shooting on Culinaris Close off Soldier Road. Head of the Central Detective Unit, Chief Superintendent Paul Roll, says two men were sitting near a van shortly after 8 p.m. when two gunmen emerged from a nearby yard and opened fire. One of the males was struck in the lower back. Uh, EMS responded here and transported that male to a uh, hospital. The second male was struck and the back, also his uh, neck. He succumbed here on the, on the scene. Shocked residents looked on as the man's body was removed from the middle of the street and placed in the back of a white hearse. The second victim, who is believed to be 24 years old, is said to be in serious condition. Shortly before that incident, Roll says a woman was shot in her lower back on Windsor Lane around 8 p.m. A female was in her residence when persons unknown came there and discharged shots at her, uh, striking her to the side. She was transported to hospital in a private vehicle and uh, where she is now being treated. This time last year, there were 101 murders. Also last night, police shot a woman after she reportedly tried to run over officers and hit six vehicles in an attempt to evade capture during a high-speed chase that started at the six-legged roundabout on John F. Kennedy Drive. CDU Chief Paul Roll says the woman, who was driving a Honda Civic with a male passenger, was caught driving in the wrong direction in one of the lanes off the roundabout around 7.30 p.m. The woman reportedly crashed the Honda into two vehicles before officers forced it to stop. The officer went out to go and speak to the persons to see what was going on. At this time, the, the driver of the vehicle uh, put the vehicle in gear and drove off, uh, nearly running the officer over. The officer then got into their vehicle and pursued the vehicle, the vehicle was turned around and went back in the opposite direction where it struck uh, two vehicles heading um, in the northern direction. Roll said the female driver then kept going, hitting another three vehicles. The officer then came out and attempted to stop this vehicle as the driver attempted to run him over. He discharged his weapon, shooting out the tire. The vehicle then continued on south, came back into the southern lane, um, sorry, in the northern lane, heading south, where he had a head-on collision with a this vehicle over here, I don't remember the type, you could look at it, and uh, that was driven at the time by a female 
and her daughter. Roll says two Mercedes-Benz, a BMW and Suzuki Swift were among the vehicles the woman crashed into. Police realized she had been shot when they arrested her and the male passenger who suffered a broken arm and leg. He says they appeared to be drunk. They were transported to hospital under police guard. The officers were not injured. And police need the public's help in locating two men wanted for questioning in connection with firearm possession. The first suspect is 21-year-old Quinton Finley of Pinewood Gardens. Finley is described as having a brown complexion, slim build, and standing about 5 foot 8 inches. The second suspect is 19-year-old Roy Stubbs, also of Pinewood Gardens. Stubbs is described as having a dark brown complexion, a medium build, and standing about 6 foot 2 inches in height. Police are asking anyone with information regarding the whereabouts of these two men, no matter how small or insignificant the tip may seem, to contact police anonymously at 919 or 328 tips. In other news, President of the Trade Union Congress, Obi Ferguson, and President of the Bahamas Customs and Immigration Allied Workers Union, Sloan Smith, today hit back at the minister responsible for public service, Shane Gibson. Gibson had accused union members of playing games and insisted they will not receive any lump sum payments until they sign off on an industrial agreement. Well, Smith says they will not sign away the rights of their members and referred to Gibson as the chief of playing games. Simone Davis reports. Members of the BCIAWU are demanding that they get their lump sum payment promised to them before Christmas. They are refusing to sign off on an industrial agreement because they say those payments are owed to them. Smith said the union members are serious, but it's the Minister of Labor who is playing games. We have a minister who is the chief of playing games. He talks about us playing games. We're not playing games. Minister, you need to get serious. The workers have earned it, and there's no need to put a carrot in the front of us. We're not desperate. What we simply want you to do is be honest with the Bahamian people, and as you have given everybody else the lump sums, then give it to Customs and Immigration. What is wrong with that? Ferguson said when he returned from Trinidad last evening, he contacted Gibson and requested to review the industrial agreement before the set signing time at 5 o'clock that evening. He said Gibson denied the request and said the union members would only be able to view the documents at 5 p.m. Ferguson said when he and other union officials arrived at Gibson's office at 5 p.m. expecting to sign off on an industrial agreement, they were presented with two separate industrial agreement proposals that they had never seen before. He said the entire process is unprofessional and unfair. This agreement covers the period from the 1st of July 2013 to the 30th of June 2018. Well, this was never negotiated. Customs and Immigration ain't on that about this. None of the officers in this room could tell you they know anything about this up to yesterday. So how would the members accept this from them saying they're voting on an agreement for 2018? That's right after the election, of course. <laughs> On Monday, Gibson told NB12 that if they signed the agreement this week, they would be paid before Christmas. However, union leaders say that is not going to happen. Ferguson said he thinks Gibson is using his power to manipulate and confuse the Bahamian people. This was given yesterday at shortly after 5. We went there to sign the agreement as the minister told the Bahamian public. Customs and immigration don't want to sign. Sloan only want to do this, and Sloan only want to do that. Well, you tell me, how can Sloan and his officers be responsible to go there at five something, to look at something that they never saw, that was never negotiated, and then you go to the Bahamian public and you say, oh, but they came here and they signed it. They're, they're, they're governed by it. This is the kind of nonsense we are up against. He added that Gibson is causing unnecessary friction among the union members. The fact is, Honorable Minister, you may need to be reined in by the Honorable Prime Minister because you're creating unnecessary friction among the union members, its leadership, and certainly friction in the country. What do you expect the workers to do in Customs and Immigration? You're obviously being spiteful toward them. Now, whatever that issue is, we can be mature about this thing and simply solve it. The deadline that you talk about has long passed. 
October has passed. November 21st has passed. And we're approaching Christmas. And guess what? You see no need to give it to them, but yet you give us two new proposals. Our news team spoke with Minister Gibson this afternoon, who said the unions were very much aware of the industrial agreements they received Monday evening. He insisted that BCIAWU officials were called on many occasions to sign the agreements, and they refused to do so. He noted that the only thing keeping those workers from getting their money is a signature. Gibson added that there are signatures as proof that these union leaders were aware of what was in the industrial agreements before they got it. Reporting for NB12, I'm Simone Davis. When NB12 returns, Dr. Richard Pinder of Bahamas Faith Ministries International is laid to rest. Stay with us.